This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the week netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. It's income tax time, and the inequality of income in America has never been a bigger issue. Economist James K. Galbraith says it's a sign of economic instability. Economic inequality also manifests itself at the ballot box, where the rich vote more than the poor and vote their self-interest, says political scientist Jan Leakley. And Bill Press talks with Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina about the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen. Then stand up and fight. Follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. James K. Galbraith is one of America's foremost progressive economists. He tells us that rising income inequality is a sign of the country's overall economic instability. And we're joined today on AmericasDemocrats.org by James Galbraith, who holds the Lloyd M. Benson Chair of Government Business Relations at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin. He is a senior scholar with the Levy Economics Institute and chair of the Board of Economists for Peace and Security, which is an international association of professional economists. James Galbraith, thank you for joining us today again on AmericasDemocrats.org. Good to be back. You're a leading voice in the discussion about income inequality. If you would, take a moment to explain how inequality can affect the overall economy of a country. Well, my view is that inequality is a um, a rising inequality is a sign of economic instability. uh, And that we saw that very clearly, for example, in the um, information technology boom of the late 1990s. Uh, Inequality measured in tax returns went up dramatically just as the stock market was going up, basically two sides of the same phenomenon, uh, and that was a sign of the unsustainability of the economic conditions of that particular era. We saw saw it again in 2007 uh, when the market was driven up by the mortgage financing uh, bubble, which or or debacle, which obviously resulted in an enormous collapse in 2008, 2009, and we see it a third time in the run-up of the stock market, run-up of inequality in the in the, in the uh, 2010 time frame. So this is, a, I think, a, a pretty well-established relationship that uh, inequality, is, inequality in the United States uh, is substantially driven by, uh, by, by credit booms, and the credit booms are uh, increasingly unsustainable. Now, there, there are plenty of economists that believe that inequality is often caused by factors outside of the control of government, but isn't there plenty of evidence that government policy contributes to the huge disparities between rich and poor? Uh, certainly, government government policy in the last 30 years, with by uh, among other things, deregulating and desupervising the financial sector, created the conditions for the rapid rise in inequality. But there are other government policies, and which, uh, including policies which affect the broad population, which have done an enormous amount to mitigate inequality. And those include Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, providing a, a basic safety net to a, a large part of the pop- working population. Uh, and the minimum wage, which uh, compresses the wage structure that raises the standards at the bottom uh, and prevents, uh, if it's set at a reasonably decent level, set prevents uh, uh, the working people from having to be reliant on welfare from falling into, into poverty. So there are tools which uh, exist and which can be used effectively to, uh, uh, to, to mitigate some of the worst consequences of high inequality. I, I want to ask you a kind of a, a two-part question here. A is what can be done to strengthen the middle class, but but the other thing is, since there are many definitions of the middle class that encompass so many people, isn't it difficult to to write an across-the-board prescription? No, it's not difficult. Uh, we have across-the-board board, uh, measures that that support and sustain the middle class. Um, and again, I mentioned the social security system, which needs to be uh, protected and even expanded, uh, health insurance, uh, um, deposit insurance to protect people's basic financial security. We need measures that will better protect people's uh, uh, tenure in their homes, um, particular protection from financial fraud, the foreclosure debacles that many middle-class families have suffered. 
Uh, and then I, I come again back to the to the minimum wage, which is the guarantor of a basic middle class living standard, ought to be the guarantor of a basic middle class or out of poverty living standard uh, for working people. Uh, and that uh, is something which is on the agenda uh, and uh, should be enacted by Congress and where it's not where Congress is not acting, uh, the individual states should be acting. California, for example, which has a Democratic supermajority, should go ahead and raise the minimum wage from the $10 that they agreed to uh, last year to uh, $12, uh, mm -hmm. 12 or $13. And, uh, you know, it's a high-cost state. They can afford a high minimum wage, and they would set a standard for the rest of the country. That should be very high on the agenda right now. You know, we're slowly seeing more and more local states, uh, or I should say, uh, that are at least talking about it more, that are that are and coming close to enacting, if not having act, enacted already. Is that the way to get the minimum wage up? Do we just does the federal government just stay out of this whole thing in order to make this happen? No, you have both uh, going at the same time, but where you can get it enacted in the states and begin to have a, a national movement, then you will move Congress. And so ultimately what you want to have happen is for the uh, intransigent opposition uh, in, in parts of the federal structure to uh, to be undermined by pressure from below. We're speaking with James Galbraith, Chair of Government uh, Business Relations at Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin, Senior Scholar with the Levy Economics Institute and Chair of the Board of Economists for Peace and Security. It's been 50 years since the war on poverty was launched. Has that war been won or lost and why? The war on poverty is an ongoing uh, uh, proposition. Uh, it all, it, in any society, you always run the risk uh, that a major economic downturn or debacle is going to generate new forms of poverty. We run that risk now, especially with respect to our immigrant populations, with respect to our undocumented working population. Uh, these are matters which uh, command our attention now. Uh, but I think if we want to go back to the historical record of the war on poverty, I think you can see that there were tremendous accomplishments uh, and that the poverty rates were effectively reduced between the launching of that war in the middle 1960s and 1980. They went up again in, uh, under considerably harsher economic policy, uh, weaker economic conditions after, after the early 1980s. Uh, but uh, as I say, these things come and go politically. Um, I think the war on poverty was one of the... Uh, uh, remarkable uh, enterprises of my lifetime. I'm, I'm happy to be uh, on the faculty of the uh, Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs, where we uh, have a very distinct historical memory of it. Okay. The Great Recession, is it over? And, and, and if so, how do we prevent the next one? Dodd-Frank, is that enough? The, the Great Recession was always a misnomer because it implied that there would be a, a, a recovery after some ordinary interval, and that has not happened. Uh, what has happened is that we have a much lower um, rate of labor force participation, much lower ratio of employment to population um, than would be predicted under those previous models. So I think we need to rethink what we expect to have as a normal economic conditions, and we need to rethink uh, what, uh, what policies are most necessary under more difficult conditions than most economists predicted after the uh, uh, the debacle of 2008. Uh, was Dodd-Frank sufficient? No, Dodd-Frank was a uh, contained some useful measures, but uh, we are still uh, deeply burdened by a vast uh, banking sector, huge institutions, very costly uh, uh, management uh, and uh, other uh, overheads, which uh, basically are adding very little uh, to the jobs or economic performance. So thinking about the structure of the financial sector remains a very um, important priority. And before we let you go, how badly is the stock market, and, and I guess Wall Street in general, rigged against the average investor, and, and, and how much does that kind of hurt economically in keeping people down, not having the, the, the access that, that perhaps others do? Well, we're, we're certainly seeing some attention to the problem of uh, high-frequency trading, which gives an advantage to uh, the, the most powerful institutions with the best and, uh, algorithms and the most rapid computers. Um, and that uh, is something which allows a few people to uh, uh, effectively to skim uh, off of the uh, um, off of the, um, uh, the investments of the whole population. 
Um, is that the fundamental issue? I think not. I think the, the, the larger questions are in the structure of the banking system. Uh, and there, um, again, we have a half a dozen banks which control uh, the, uh, the entire financial system of the United States, and that has going to have profound effects on the willingness and ability of finance to support employment. And again, we need to have new institutions for decentralized and competitive financial structure, less well-paid bankers uh, that are more engaged in their communities you know, to, to back those who are over those who aren't. That's where financial reform needs to really focus on, okay. on getting the job done for Americans. All right. James Galbraith, uh, Lloyd Benson, Chair of Government Business Relations at Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin, Senior Scholar, Levy Economics Institute, and Chair of the Board of Economists for Peace and Security. James, as always, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to doing it again with you soon. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast of Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. Research by political scientist Jan Leakley shows that the rich and the poor vote about the same on most issues, except economic issues. And that's why voting is not likely to improve things for the poor. And we'll talk to her about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. No matter how small the hall, a thief is a thief, right? If a poverty wage fast food worker sneaks out a couple of burgers to take home to the kids, the bosses yell, thief. But what do you call it when the bosses steal from those same workers? How about outrageous, disgusting, or simply unbelievable? Well, believe it or not, it's happening every day in multiple ways, and not by a few bad apples, but in what has become routine corporate practice by McDonald's, Burger King, Domino's, and other hugely profitable chains. Technically, it's called wage theft, and it involves such slick-fingered moves as erasing hours from employee time cards, requiring off-the-clock work, not paying for overtime hours, refusing to reimburse workers for gas they bought while making deliveries, or inventing uniform fees and other deductions that illegally drop pay below the minimum wage. Come on, isn't it shameful enough that these global behemoths pay rock-bottom wages without them circling back like low-life pickpockets to steal from their own employees? This is not just corporate thievery, it's thuggery. How low can fast-food greed go? So low that the top bosses at headquarters play a sleazy game of hide-and-seek, pretending that they have nothing to do with this rip-off. Personnel practices, they airily claim, are left to local franchisees who are, quote, independent business owners. Bovine excrement. Corporate Central dictates how much mustard each franchise can put on a bun. So to think that it doesn't monitor every dime in payroll is a ludicrous lie. This is Jim Hightower saying, in a recent survey of fast food workers, 9 out of 10 said they have had wages stolen by their bosses. This thievery has become business as usual, and it's worse than shameful. It's slimy. For more information, go to National Employment Law Project at NELP.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Political scientist Jan Leakley has studied the effect of income on voter turnout, and not surprisingly, poor people are less likely to vote, partly because they don't see any point to it, since the rich vote more frequently in their own economic interest than do the poor. 
And we welcome to the program Jan Leakley, whose research and teaching interests focus on American political behavior, voter turnout, media and politics, and the political behavior of racial and ethnic groups. She is co-author of the new book called Who Votes Now? Demographics, Issues, Inequality, and Turnout in the United States. Jan Leakley, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you. Great to be here. And nice to have you with us as well. You know, at a time when income inequality has become part of the national political discussion, what have you found out about its effects uh, or how it affects elections? Well, though we don't address inequality and how it changes elections directly, one of the things we find is that um, poor people, folks in the lowest um, part of the income distribution, they are not seeing differences between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, They're not seeing choices offered to them. And as a result, one of the things we argue is that um, this makes them less likely to vote. And so uh, to the extent that changes over time, who shows up at the polls changes. You can imagine candidates take different positions. The interpretations of um, election wins or uh, outcomes uh, changes as well as you see a wealthier and wealthier electorate. So are you saying then there's a cause and effect at work here that that low turnout by lower income groups actually results in the income distribution gap? Um, yes, we we um, I, we can go that far and say that um, one of the arguments is if we have a more class biased electorate, um, officials know who who votes and they know what policies those people those voters want and. Part of small d democracy is you give voters what they want. If that's the case, then you know we can uh, say a few things about expectations about policies that are adopted to redistribute wealth, right? If you're uh, providing policies in response to who's voting and you have wealthier voters, uh, it would be likely that you would adopt policies that are less generous for the poor. Hmm. Is the difference between how the rich vote and how the rest of us vote limited to economic issues? Uh, For the most part. For the most part. Um, I mean, this is where we see a big gap uh, between the poor and the wealthy uh, are specifically on those issues that relate to redistribution. So the provision of government services uh, and uh, spending in that regard. When you shift to social issues, when you shift to some other broader policies, foreign affairs, for example, um, you really don't see any differences between uh, in the positions that the wealthy take and the positions that the poor take. They're indistinguishable. That yeah. signal from the from who votes is indistinguishable based on on income. When it comes to government services and essentially the role of government, um, what it should be doing. Uh, when you're in in that territory, then indeed there's substantial differences between the two groups. Well, you know, a, a, an interesting aside to that is you have a lot of people who, who you know, anti-big government, anti-big government. But when you turn around, if they take the time to turn around and look at what they take advantage of, they're, the government's helping them out immensely. Exactly. We have n- not... not um, uh, our research, and I should have noted um, this book is co-authored with Jonathan Nagler at uh, New York University. And so Jonathan and I's work hasn't focused on uh, on that topic, but indeed what political scientists have shown and demonstrated is that if you ask individuals, do they receive any government benefits, and in asked in appropriate professional you know, polling standards, um, they're not aware of the many tax advantages they get, specific programs, things that kids get in schools. They're simply not aware that it's a government uh, expenditure. Mm -hmm. Home ownership. I mean, home ownership. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. So and and, uh, so now historically, there had not really been a big difference in how people voted based on their income. When and why did that change occur? The, um, there's always been a bit a bit of a difference. I mean, the, the, our work builds on a, a the, kind of a, a previous study of voter turnout that was based on the 1972 presidential election, and even then, um, the wealthy voted more uh, more often than the poor at a higher rate than the poor. So this is not new in terms of actually showing up at the polls. Um, 
And so um, not much of a change there. I think the, the, the other change actually uh, somewhat interesting is that if you, we look at voter turnout, if you think about how the wealthy vote and how the poor vote, one of the puzzles that we can't address is um, that that as inequality has increased in society, we don't see necessarily a big sort on who the poor are voting for and who uh, the wealthy are voting for. Jonathan and I's intuition is that's in part because the poor are opting out of voting hmm. because they don't see any any choices there. We're speaking with Jan Leakley uh, among the many things, many hats that she wears. She also co-authored a book, Who Votes Now? Demographics, Issues, Inequality, and Turnout in the United States. You know, at the same time that, that you say wealthier, more conservative people are voting more, aren't there also trends that give hope to progressives? Well, the one um, trend... Uh, or at least a consistent pattern, is uh, the strong role that education plays in determining who shows up at the polls. Um, that um, individuals, and it's, it's the leading factor, uh, the strongest relationship that we observe, uh, and it has only gotten stronger uh, than in 72, a bit stronger. And that is that the people who are highly educated are more likely to vote than those who are less educated. So to the extent that education really um, drives that process in some way, um, you know, that I think is a hopeful uh, and positive thing. Mm -hmm. Does the solution to this disparity lie simply in reforming election laws, you know, instant registration, more early voting, and what chance would reforms have in states that are hell-bent on restricting voting? And we're seeing a lot of that. You know, you're, you're asking about kind of the positive, the potential positive effects of election laws uh, to allow more people to vote and then the potential negative effects of using them to restrict voting. And I think the, the effects are asymmetrical, if you will. Um, I think the harsher the rhetoric and the laws adopted are um, uh, treating a voter turnout as a highly legalistic and high security um, process and one in which there are concerns about the basic processes of democracy being um, manipulated. Um, I think that's yet another reason why it's just easier for people to stay home. It sends a message that their vote isn't valued. Um, on the positive side, what we have, uh, our, our book focuses on the election laws and I can't say that they're the answer. Um, at least immediately, most of the estimates that we provide on absentee voting and election day registration are about a 2 to 3 percent increase in turnout if you shift to election day registration, um, if you shift to having uh, more lenient absentee voting, you get two or about maybe two or three percentage points, which is a lot in some close elections, right? So that's good. But I think the key, and this is more indirect from our work, the key is if party and candidate organizations are not investing in efforts to inform people about the laws, how to register, when the election is, and how their interests are reflected in the campaign issues, and that their vote is valued by the candidate or the party, um, you know, unless the elites are doing what they need to do, I don't know that there's a magical formula that would increase turnout anymore. Mm -hmm. so I'm I always shocked at the stories of people, why they don't go out and vote. And I think to myself, but this is your opportunity. This is your chance. I mean, you may have a small voice, but it's one of many. And I think, you know, to the extent that all politics is local and a lot of politics happens in the middle or is good to happen in the middle, um, I think if you're talking about individuals with kind of moderate levels of education, moderate levels of income, those are the people who are 50-50 or maybe 40% likely to vote. Right. For those people, that additional piece of information, being contacted by a candidate, being contacted by a voter organization, by whatever groups might be operating in that dimension, for them, that 
contact could be just enough to shift them over the edge to say, I'll get up 15 minutes earlier or I will read more uh, so that I feel confident about who I'm voting for or I will find a ride or make time to vote. Those people are good. I think what our uh, you know that observation that we make is that the, it's the poorest in our society, the lowest 20% of the income groups, um, that my sense is they've just opted out. You know, the yeah. economic system isn't working for them. The political system isn't working for them. Probably the educational system is not working for them. And to ask those individuals to make such a heroic jump and say, you know, uh, the answer might be, why should I go and vote? I could instead, you know, see if, you know, go to a store that's 10 minutes further away from home to buy groceries that I can afford for $10 less. Now that's a material difference in, in that person's life. Maybe the outcome of the election, not quite so clear. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, before we let you go, is, is low turnout, generally, and the tilt toward the rich specifically, due to a perception that there's just no essential difference between the candidates? Uh, we think that's an important part of it. Um, I think popular culture, um, the dominant messages that we get from there, um, uh, for right or for wrong, uh, are that uh, government officials are, um, they are all, right? All officials are dirty, they're corrupt, they're self-serving. Uh, the government itself doesn't function. It's bureaucratic. We have all negative messages there. Yeah. Um, well, and that that's constantly perpetuated now uh, on a lot of the cable news stations, um, and and a lot of times not with the truth. You exactly. Know, the, the truth is greatly altered, and, and and people go by that. They don't yeah. they don't do any more digging on their own. Yeah, and uh, you know the one um, you know the one example that someone gets about someone who receives benefits from the government, for example, is what the you know stereotypical person who uses food stamps or benefit awards, you know, for something that's objectionable. It doesn't show highlight the story about the person who was able to feed a child, you know, feed their child or take them to the emergency room or whatever, um, after you know for basic essential needs. Um, so you don't see when the policies work. You're just seeing kind of the negative. So, you know, that's th that negative environment, I think, is um, overcomes or overwhelms. Whatever, I think it puts a lot of individuals, especially lower income, lower in education individuals, into a world where those politicians might be saying different things. Those candidates might be dramatically different. But it's just all babble to them. It's background noise um, mm -hmm. to those individuals with the foreground noise being, you know, government is useless and it's bad and, you know, whatever those those themes are. We need a different message machine for the general populace. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that'd be a good thing. I, um, mm -hmm. Now we have to find somebody to do it. <laughs> yeah. And because, he, because, I mean, we, we try as best we can. Uh, politicians don't have – nobody's listening to them, I guess, because since they're considered so evil. Exactly. I think, you know, the, the risk that you have or the problem is in our political world, the, per, the, the person or organization that wants to come along to provide that alternative perspective, the incentive quickly becomes to overpromise and over-exaggerate Right. And so I think clear, reasonable messages and honest messages about, you know, what can be accomplished, what's reasonable to be accomplished, what the baselines are, what the ambition is, uh, you know, to treat people, whether they're highly educated or not, whether they're wealthy or not, uh, address kind of basic expectations. And that's not what I think the campaign world or the governance world does anymore. A whole lot. No. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, and in fact, I, I was wondering where all that stuff would come from. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a subject Jan for another Le discussion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jan Leakley, co-author of the new book, Who Votes Now? Demographics, Issues, Inequality, and Turnout in the United States. Joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Jan, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We 
want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press and his guest, South Carolina Congressman Jim Clyburn. President Obama in Austin, Texas today at the LBJ Library. He will be giving the keynote address for the Civil Rights Summit down in Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, also celebrating the legacy of President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who pushed through the both the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act through the Congress, a man who's been right in the heart of those battles uh, and continues to fight that good fight in the House of Representatives today. The assistant Democratic leader of the House, Congressman from South Carolina, the Honorable James Clyburn. Congressman, good uh, to see you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We looked. Uh, we always look forward to talking to the whip when you were in that position. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, those were four uh, good uh, and challenging years. <laughs> it didn't last long enough. Not long enough. Not long enough. We'll be back. We'll be back. That's Absolutely. a fighting spirit. That's Absolutely. what I like to hear. Yeah. But when, and when you look at this president and the presidency and what he was able to accomplish, it was those first two years, really, where you were able to get things done. It's, Absolutely. Things have changed since, haven't they? A whole lot since. Uh, those first uh, two years, I think, were uh, very, very productive because— uh, we fed off of uh, the energy of 2008. I think that um, we sort of uh, rest on our laurels, so mm. to speak. At least our constituents did. Uh, and in 2010, uh, that election yielded a far different result uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, and then that um, uh, put us in a pretty bad place that we're still trying to dig out of. Congressman, have you ever seen a time when um, the party on the other side just refused to even consider uh, a- any accommodation or any, to use the word, compromise or any uh, uh, you know, opportunity yeah. to work together? Well, uh, compromise has become a, a bad word. In fact, I was absolutely amazed a few years ago when uh, John Boehner refused to even allow himself to use the word. Um, and that, to me, uh, was beyond the pale. Now, the fact of the matter is, if you go back to the 50s, when we were uh, first uh, coming off of the uh, 54 uh, Supreme Court decision, and we had a Civil Rights Act in 1957 uh, that uh, got very, very contentious. Now, it was almost nothing more than an expression of of, uh, principles. Mm -hmm. However, you may recall Strom Thurmond from my state, set the filibuster record, uh, fighting off uh, that uh, watering it down because it eventually passed. But you may recall during that debate, things got very, very contentious. Uh, Strom Thurmond even wrestled uh, uh-huh. uh, Ralph Yarbrough down to the floor uh, to keep him from going into a room uh, so that there would not be a quorum. Uh, it got very physical. Yeah. And then you may recall after uh, that, um, uh, the... Uh, Southern Manifesto uh, that costed sure. uh, positions of a lot of senators. So it, uh, but I don't think we've had uh, it quite this way uh, simply because we now have the 30 second sound bites kind of ruling the world. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, when you look at the Civil Rights Summit in Austin, Texas, sure. 50 years later, um, maybe we, we don't appreciate how important that legislation was at the time, right? Really historic. That and the Voting Rights Act. Oh, yeah. Uh, people really don't. And um, I, uh, uh, two Sundays ago, I went up to New York uh, to see the play all oh, the way. All the way. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, that's the name of the play. Uh, I've, commemorating seen, the I've seen it. You've seen it? Yeah. It is just absolutely an incredible play. I told someone it's 85% accurate. I mean, there's some license being taken, but uh, yeah. uh, having lived through all of that, uh, I, that play just brought back memories that uh, are very profound. And the uh, LBJ's ability to work with Congress and to get something done, especially, sure. as you point out, the Democrats in, in the Senate from his own party 
who were the, opposing the civil rights absolutely. bill. Absolutely. The byplay between Johnson and Russell uh, was just absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, this, this may be interesting to the audience. Um, the deal I had with my wife was that um, uh, if um, uh, we had a boy as our first child, um, uh, his name would have been Jay Everett. Uh, I mean, I was that enamored with Jay Everett Dixon until yeah. I really wanted, uh, if I had a son, uh, for his name to be Jay, Jay Everett. You would have named your son after a Republican? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, absolutely would have done that. I mean, look, I'm sitting there watching all this stuff, uh, having met my wife in jail uh, because of the things that we were doing back then, and uh, uh, watching uh, Johnson, uh, the deals were made uh, with uh, uh, Dirksen when he committed to get the uh, to get the votes to break the filibuster. Uh, I was just enamored with him, I, and and I, I uh, of course, his name would not have been uh, ever. It would have been uh, the J would have been the J A Y. It wouldn't have been James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when when you look at L B J and uh, as they're doing now in Austin, and you look at as we mentioned the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Medicare, Medicaid, the Immigration Act that he had passed at the time on education, on clean water, Absolutely. clean air. Right. That was a time, Congressman, when it wasn't when Congress could sure. get things done and a president could do things. I think that people uh, tend not to get the full scope of what Johnson's uh, 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 address was to Congress uh, back in, uh, in 1964 when he called for a war on poverty. Yeah, uh, everybody right. seemed to limit that to uh, community action programs uh, and the like. Uh, but he was building on a law that had been passed a year before, the Manpower Development and Training Act, which was uh, Kennedy's uh, first step uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then that was followed by the Comprehensive em Employment and Training Act. But Johnson saw that what really needed to, to be done was for people... Uh, at the grassroots level to get involved in the process. And if you look at the civil, the, 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 um, uh, that bill, the uh, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity, it was grounded in uh, forcing people at the local levels to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it was all about. So that was a part of it. And then, if you recall, it was just uh, a few months later uh, that we got – uh, the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Uh, and um, all of that uh, was a broad uh, thrust uh, toward a great society. Uh, and it did not fail, in spite of what uh, people say. It did not fail. It succeeded tremendously. And what, how would you describe the state of civil rights in this, in this country today? I mean, have we, have we accomplished our goal, case closed, no need to worry about it anymore? Uh, all you got to do is uh, look at the, uh, the recent Supreme Court decisions, and you'll know full well that a lot of the battles that we thought were behind us uh, could very well be in front of us. Uh, and people have to remember the same Supreme Court that gave us uh, Dred Scott in 1854, gave us Plessy uh, in 1896. That same Supreme Court uh, gave us Brown in 1954. And now... Uh, it seems to be going back in the other direction. We have to be uh, vigilant uh, in all of this. And I, and I think that um, that is the one thing uh, that we tend uh, not to do well enough. We have the victories with Barack Obama, yeah. uh, the validations of King's dream, and the vindication of all of us who adhered to it. But we were not vig vigilant enough uh, in order to keep from having to uh, uh, re uh, walk uh, those roads. Well, particularly one of the battlefields, it seems to me, is it not, is um, the Republican <clears throat> efforts to suppress the vote. No doubt what they're all about. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's the part of you got the Supreme Court uh, gutting uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, just as we we're getting ready to celebrate its 50th uh, anniversary next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got these legislatures all over the country. Uh, these so-called photo uh, ID laws, and uh, and you having uh, legislators uh, pronouncing their reasons for doing it, 
And I get a little bit uh, ticked off when I hear people saying, well, you know, this is just the ID voters to keep down fraud. Not when the guy who wrote the bill says, we promise you to give you uh, a ID law that will allow Romney to win Pennsylvania, and mm -hmm. we did it. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't say uh, to get rid of fraud. Right. Uh, he says to suppress the vote. And that's exactly what this is all about. And that's what they're doing in state after state. After Absolutely. State. Honored to have in the studio with us uh, Congressman James Cliburn from uh, the 6th District in uh, South Carolina. What part of South Carolina is that? Uh, that's Charleston, up to Columbia, Florence, Orangeburg, Sumter. Uh, oh, man. Every place I've ever lived. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, what a great district. Yeah, thank Even you. the city of Charleston alone. Oh, yeah. It's a great, yeah, I love great place. Love going down there. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, some good eating down there. Oh, yeah. Good food there. Columbia ain't bad either, uh, uh, if any of my folks in Columbia are listening. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Don, uh, Don and Carol Fowler, are they still uh, there? Uh, night before last, they had a big event down there for Bonnet Franks. Uh, I saw Bonnie last night. He oh, just really? got back from there, yeah. Oh. They had a place thing at their home for Bonnie Franks last night. Oh, night before last. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Barney's still out there, huh? He's still out there and still going great. So, Congressman, the uh, Senate, by bipartisan met vote, sends over a, a bill <clears throat> to the House to uh, increase the minimum wage. Or, or, yeah. And what's going to happen in the House? Uh, uh, not much. Not much. I don't think the bill will, will come to the floor. Uh, they just did unemployment insurance. They just passed the yeah. uh, unemployment that's insurance. That's not going to come to the floor. Uh, the speaker's already announced that. So not much is going to happen. Well, so in these midterm elections, we were talking about this earlier on the program. How can they go to the voters in their district and say, you know, we're against raising minimum wage, we're against extended unemployment benefits, and now we're against equal pay for women? Yeah. The well, Paycheck, because Paycheck Fairness Act shot down yesterday. Well, because last redistricting, and that's what happened to us after 2010, I don't think enough people focused on what the real impact of off-year elections can be, especially every 10th year. Mm -hmm. And in 2010, uh, because legislatures and governorships change so dramatically as a result of us uh, not staying on the field, uh, after the 2008 elections, um, uh, we got some legislatures that, that changed these lines. These congressional districts, like right now, I'm the only uh, Democrat uh, from uh, South Carolina, as good a guy as John Spratt was, as effective a legislator as he was, the district that was drawn for him uh, to run in uh, in 2012-10, it was just absolutely uh, impossible uh, for him. There's only one Democrat from Mississippi, one Democrat from Alabama, no Democrat in the Congress from Arkansas, uh, one from Louisiana, because what they've done, they have uh, structured uh, and sculptured uh, these congressional districts in such a way that those guys don't think they have a price to pay. So they can vote this way uh, and not worry about whether or not they get returned to the Congress. That's their calculation. Now, uh, how do you get around that? Um, we are going to have to have a 2012 uh, and 2008 uh, turnout in 2014. I, I, the vote's got to be that big. In other Absolutely. words, um, so many Democrats, and I remember in 2010, where people were saying, well, you know, we got Obama elected, right? He's yep. in there right now. So right. we kind of, we've done our job, and it's, they were asleep at the switch, right? Asleep at the switch, absolutely. Yeah. So the same thing, when is the next chance to redraw those lines? Uh, 2020, uh, to be effective uh, yeah. uh, for the uh, uh, 20, uh, 22 elections. It's, it's really why these governor's races and state legislative races, which get very little attention, are so Absol important. That's exactly right. Very yeah. important. I have a question. When you talk about Southern Democrats, do you watch House of Cards? Because <laughs> Frank Underwood is a Democrat from South Carolina. Uh, from a little town of Gaffney up there. I, uh, I watched the first two. Okay. Um, and I'm still um, uh, trying to get around to the, uh, the others. Uh, now, uh, my chief of staff mm. uh, has watched all uh -huh. of last season uh -huh. and this season. You can watch them all at one time. Um, but um, I have not seen them. I went out and got Netflix and everything else, and I'm paying that 
uh, money every month and still can't sit down to watch it. Yeah, I'm t- yeah. I, just, I was curious because it's a South Carolina yeah. Democrat. I love yeah. that show. I didn't realize Underwood was from South Carolina. Yeah, Never yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. From uh, Cherokee County, a little town of Gaffney. And that's why they talk about that little uh, water tower out there. The, the big peach. shape of a peach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, uh, Georgia is the peach state, but the fact of the matter is we produce more peaches that's in right. South Carolina and better peaches in South Carolina than Georgia. Oh, that's, that's a fighting word. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. You know, I'm a California congressman, but I grew up in Delaware. We have some damn good peaches in Delaware. <laughs> I want you to know. In that's su- great. I know. Su- Southern Delaware is a peach a, country yeah. down over there. Well, that's so. why I like you so much, I guess. Uh, Joe Biden and I uh, used to josh a lot on the um, uh, Charlie Rose show. Uh, uh, yeah. And we used to be on there a lot uh, uh, trying to compliment each other. But um, uh, yeah. Delaware is a state that I've started studying a lot about. In fact, uh, one of those cases, you may recall, in the Brown decision, one of those cases, there were five cases wrapped into one, and one of them came out of Delaware. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the, the, the Briggs case came out of South Carolina. Davis case came out of Virginia. Uh, Bolton uh, from Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And the Belton case uh, it came from uh, Delaware. And they were all lumped with Brown from Kansas uh, to become Brown versus the Board of Education. Well, since we're talking to the Supreme Court, we just have a little less than a minute left, Congressman. What impact of this latest? What's the impact of this latest Supreme Court decision? It is going to be dramatic, uh, and I think it's going to be horrific. Uh, it pumps too much money uh, into politics, uh, putting corporations. Uh, on equal standing uh, with individuals, having unlimited uh, funds. And, 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 you know, I don't argue about how much money you want to spend, but I really believe it ought to be transparent uh, for people to be able to spend this money uh, and not reveal themselves, and you don't know exactly who uh, is attacking. It goes against a fundamental principle uh, that we have in jurisprudence is that uh, you should always be allowed uh, to confront your accuser. Yeah. And it takes that out of politics, and that is absolutely uh, horrific. Well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have you in the studio, Congressman. Thank you so much for yeah. taking time this morning on your way to work. Oh, yeah. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. James K. Galbraith, Jan Leakley, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate.